Good evening and welcome to yet another edition of Law and Order brought to you exclusively by Channel I. Last week we had a very special guest with us and with him we were able to analyze the state of sports in Sri Lanka from a legal perspective. It was an extremely enlightening session and we have him this week as well. He is none other than Mr. Shanaka Amrasinghe, who counts more than 16 years in the legal profession and also as a sports analyst and broadcaster. Shanaka, thank you once again for joining us in the studios at Channel I. Thank you for having me back. I think um, our uh, show last week mm -hmm. just flew by simply because we there was so much to discuss and um, I think that what we shared with our viewers was extremely enlightening because it, it is information that we as the public should be aware of, but we just aren't, mm -hmm. particularly because we are such sports lovers. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the sake of our viewers who could not join us last week, could you just um, enlighten us on what the sports law of Sri Lanka is and how effective it is? Uh, well, sports law is one particular act, an act of 1973, and it legislated for sport which existed, I think, at that time, uh, Mokshini. In 1973, sports was a lot different from what it was in the mid-90s and certainly very different from what it was in 2019 uh, because in 73, even professional athletes were not allowed to participate even in the Olympic Games. So it was very much an amateur era. And uh, the law needs to be updated in order to keep pace with the ever-changing world of sport. Uh, so what the Sri Lankan sports uh, law does is that it establishes a National Sports Council, first of all, uh, which is a 15-member body which has just been reappointed by uh, the Honorable Minister Harin Fernando. And that apex body looks over sports, it uh, creates policy for sports, and it hopefully implements that policy as well. Uh, what the sports law also does is it sets up district level committees for uh, sports uh, bodies to, for the development of sport. How well those district committees are monitored, how well they're regulated is another matter uh, that really needs a lot of discussion. But what it does is it sets up those bodies. It sets up the National Institute for Sports Science also, which is great because I'm noticing a lot more uh, realization of the errors that may have been committed in training methods back in the day, maybe when this law was passed. But I'm noticing that a lot of new technical officers are coming out of the Institute of Sports Science who have um, an eye for the job, who know exactly what they're doing. So hopefully in the future it will change uh, a little bit where the district committees are actually manned by people who know exactly what they're doing and have a qualification uh, to do that job. So uh, they set those things up. Uh, they also uh, provide for the registration with the sports ministry of national associations for sports. So national associations for sports, and we have 63 such sports registered with the ministry, are the apex bodies for the sport in Sri Lanka. So whatever development happens in that sport happens uh, in conjunction with the ministry, the funds that the ministry may give, together with the funds that any national association may raise from sponsorship or donors or whoever. And they are the ones who work together, or at least they should be the ones working together, to develop the sport. Uh, so that's what the sports law really provides for. One aspect we couldn't touch on uh, last week, and we probably should mention this week, uh, Mokshini, is the fact that the sports law does this for the development of sport. Uh, but also the education ministry has a huge involvement because school sports are such a massive thing in uh, Sri Lanka because we notice that school uh, cricket, school rugby, school athletics are so uh, competitive and we somehow don't be, seem to be able to make the step up from school, uh, from sport, uh, from school sport to, to the professional mm -hmm. national level. Uh, so while the laws exist to regulate all this, whether we are getting the balance right is an issue that we need to discuss. So from 1973 up to today, 2019, have we seen any amendments to the Act? We've seen a couple of amendments, but one of them was in 1996 to establish the National Institute of Sports Science uh, or to call it the National Institute of Sports Science. So we haven't seen a real material amendment. Uh, and also the National Olympic Committee was set up by an amendment as well. So that was brought under the auspices of uh, the sports law. So we haven't seen any material changes to the Act to Mokshini to govern the issues that we have been talking about, which we had talked about and which we probably will touch on a little later. So I think the sports law is in dire need of updating, yeah. uh, not so much amendment as updating itself right. from so if you take even the evidence ordinance that 
we use every day in court. You've had to have amendments to update itself to electronic evidence and the changing technology. So this is no different. So what we observe right now is um, a decline in the at, at the level of professionalism. I wouldn't say professionalism, but the skill level that is displayed by our sportsmen on the field, mm -hmm. as opposed to the way back in the 90s when we saw so many great champions of the sport coming out, like our 1996 World Cup team and uh, the Damianti Darshas and the Susantika Jaisinghas and the Julian Bowlings of track and field and sports respectively, mm -hmm. uh, and swimming respectively. Um, but we haven't seen that improving. We, we haven't seen sportsmen of that caliber being produced today. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas if we even look at countries in the region, in maybe even in the SARC region, we see a marked difference. Uh, what is it that, uh, what is the distinction between these other countries and ours that you can make that is causing them mm -hmm. to rise to the occasion and just keep moving forward and progress, whereas we seem to be tied down? What would you think that is? Uh, well, I think it's the fact that uh, the other countries have progressed since we talked about professionalism in the mid-90s coming into sports in general, not just into cricket and rugby, but into sports in general, I don't think we have kept up the pace, mm -hmm. so to speak. Uh, and as a result of that, we've fallen away. We had some very naturally talented athletes that you mentioned, people like Susantika uh, Jayasinghe, once in a generation yeah. uh, athletes, really. Uh, but if you look at her also, she succeeded almost despite the system, not mm. because of the system. And you've had a lot of players uh, who have reached global, uh, uh, global stardom, people like Lasit Malinga, who have succeeded despite the system and not because of the system. He was playing beach cricket. He was picked up by a coach who happened to see him. And then he was taken from one school to a bigger school. And that's how he managed to come in. So it's not like the district level systems are working intricately well to pick up this talent at a lower level. So if you're not picking up talent, India have 1.2 billion people. We have 20 million. So you need to be able to pick up every rough diamond you see. and. Uh, that's something that I don't think is happening. And just to add a little bit of fact to, uh, to what might be couched as opinion, if you say Sri Lanka sports have declined, people may ask, well, who are you to say that? But the fact is that Sri Lanka's Asian Games contingent had its worst showing ever in the last Asian Games that we took part in. We couldn't come back with a single medal. And uh, that's something that really ha is a problem. In the junior ranks, I don't think we have that much of a problem because the school system is still working pretty well. vibrant. Mm. I, don't say it's, I won't say it's working well, oh, I see. Okay. but it's vibrant. And at school level, at junior level, Mokshini, you can get by uh, on natural talent to an extent. But when, professional, when you're competing against professional athletes, athletes who have then taken their um, part-time student athletics to the next level of being a professional, our athletes don't have the ability to keep up with them, which is why at senior level we're failing while we are relatively a little bit more successful at junior level. So these are the issues uh, that really crop up because we haven't really been able to, to keep in touch. And like we said, 7 billion rupees allocated last year uh, for the Ministry of Sports. Where is that money going and is it reaping the benefits of its uh, investment? That's the question we need to ask. So aren't we, aren't our national sports bodies accountable in any way to the apex international bodies? Well, they are. Uh, but once again, I, I wouldn't uh, profess that the Apex international bodies are also squeaky clean. I see. Uh, Mokshini, that's another issue as well because it, there were the hugely publicized issue of, of um, cash for votes when we had the Olympic voting happen. Right. So the International Olympic Committee has um, a committee that goes about and checks the venues that have submitted their bids. And a lot of the venues were rumored to have been giving cash to their committees who came over on the reconnaissance uh, to say, award it to us. We are the best. And there have been money changing hands. It happened with Sepp Blatter at FIFA as well, which is the largest sporting organization in the governing body in the world. And uh, that was rife with corruption. Uh, so accountability in terms of our accountability to the global stage, I don't think that's going to help us really very much because let's be honest, nobody really cares about Sri, Sri Lanka too much except maybe the ICC, the International Olympic Committee, we are just a participating country. Right? We get wild card entries for, uh, uh, for a lot of things until since Susantika, nobody has even made a blip on that flat line that has been uh, Sri Lankan athletics or, or Sri Lankan sports uh, at an international level. 
And uh, we've been dipping, we have been dipping, and you're right to say that. Uh, in 2012, when uh, Mr. Ben Gollings, who was the best rugby sevens player in the world at that time, when the Rugby Football Union asked him to come and coach, uh, we skyrocketed into third place in the seventh circuit in Asia. And uh, we had household names, Srinath Surya Bandar, I remember going for a uh, seven series in Singapore, and all the other Malaysian, the Singaporean teams, I could hear them asking, is Suri playing? You know, that kind, that's the kind of buzz we created. It was amazing. Uh, but suddenly we've dipped again, so we're not at that consistent level number three. Why? Because Gollings brought in a brand of professionalism. Mm. He kept the players on the training paddock from morning till evening. They hated it, but they were good. And uh, that's something, that's a culture that we need to inculcate in uh, this uh, Sri Lankan context. So unless the big money is brought in, the skills come with it. He had been a member of a vastly successful England team. Uh, he came with them and he was able to pass on that knowledge and he had accountability. I'm sure the board told him, look, you get us from here to here, otherwise we're not paying you any, any further. We're not extending your contract. And uh, those are the things that need to happen. And when you look at the rumors that have been flying around on uh, Chandik Hathar Singh's contract, the details of that have gone viral. And we need to have metrics in place to say, if you're paying someone so much money, what are the things you're judging him on? Um, you can't judge him on, on uh, match results because those are not in his control. But have you judged him on maybe injury prevention? Have you judged him by how many players that he has uh, brought into the circuit? Have you, brought, have you judged him on the contributions that have been made at a lower level rather than the national level? So there's a lot of professionalism that needs to come in. Just like anybody in a company has a performance appraisal at the end of the year, do we have that in sport? And the answer is probably not at a scientific level. So I think it would be safe to say that um, th it is necessary to have a regulation of um, these decisions that affect sports in Sri Lanka. And mm. that has to come by way of the law. Is that not right? I mean, that's the only way that we can ensure that we are kept uh, on the straight and narrow, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, but then at the same time, if, we ha if the law is so stringent, then does it choke the life out of sports, you know, because sports is essentially something you do because you're passionate about mm -hmm. it. And even the viewers are passionate about their sports. Um, so, yeah, so I mean, on the one hand, we do recognize the fact that the law has to regulate it in order that we have the best possible sportsmen coming up and representing their country mm -hmm. at an international level. But at the same time, we don't want uh, it to become so mechanical yeah. Uh, that there is no more any passion in it. Let's go back a step and let's look at the first principles of why we legislate uh, Mokshini. So say you've got the penal code has an offense of murder. So normal orderly life, we're talking about law and order on this show, but a normal orderly life should entail that you don't go around killing people. But it happens. So you have to have an offense and you have to have the police investigating and you have to have a court system and you have to have a conviction to be a, for it to be a deterrent. So in a developed system, and I don't know whether there are any countries like this, but in a developed system where people don't go around killing each other, you could argue that perhaps don't, they don't need an offensive murder. But what you say is correct if our system was professional if our system was self-regulating, if our system was a meritocracy, if we didn't have corruption at every level, if uh, we didn't have uh, people at under 13 synchronized swimming having to make complaints about the fact that th not the right person was selected. Did that actually happen? It actually happened. Uh, so, uh, under 13? Um, um, it was a very junior age group. <laughs> I may be, okay. uh, may be a little off on the, um, on the actual uh, level, group. but mm -hmm. it was a very junior age group and people were being selected for a meet and there was an issue and then they had to rush to the sports ministry because the constitution of those governing bodies in this instance SLASU uh, didn't have enough of an absence of conflicts of interest. So that raises the um, issue should we have a governing body appointed by say the National Sports Council which will say we will arbitrate on everything um, with regard to things like team selection and lack of process. So what you said about the law actually regulating too much Mokshini is this. Um, you may think Lasit Malinga should play in the team. I may think, no, he shouldn't play in the team. So that should not be a judgment you and I get to make. 
And unfortunately, with the ministry's involvement and with the ability of people petitioning um, and saying, I didn't, I didn't play, you shouldn't play, you're substituting the discretion of a coach or a selector by ministerial authority. And that's something we need to take pains to avoid when we do eventually um, amend the sports law. So as you correctly said, you could constrict uh, the functioning of sports, if every decision you make, if every player you select to the team, you've got to be looking over your shoulder and thinking, okay, is that guy's parent or is his coach or is his someone going to go and rush to the minister? Uh, so you can have over-regulation, certainly. But in Sri Lanka at the moment, I think we really do need to find that right balance. And I think it can be done if the right people are entrusted with it. So uh, what you're saying is it shouldn't be a subjective process. Mm -hmm. um, people shouldn't be able to make a call on based on what they feel or their assessment, whereas it should, there should be guidelines which make it objective and so on. Yeah, exactly. I agree, it, I agree it with you. It should be the refinement of the processes mm. rather than uh, substitution of decisions. So I think the sports law can be amended or regulations can be passed where every national association is required to publish at the start of its year what their selection criteria are going mm. to be for certain meets. Then it's transparent as well, isn't it? Exactly. And uh, it should be uh, the case where the uh, any aggrieved parent or any aggrieved athlete can go to the sports ministry and say, uh, where is that publication? They can use the RTI, they can use whatever other mechanism. They can go and say, where is that selection criteria? Right, I've met all these criteria. Why wasn't why? I selected and why was the person who didn't meet the criteria selected? Absolutely. So those processes can easily be put in place and won't create, like you said, the constriction of over-regulation. I see. Um, now the other question now, we're going to transition into somewhat of a controversial uh, topic right now, but it is something that we can't uh, avoid as well when we're talking about this topic, but uh, the level of the minister in the decision-making processes mm -hmm. of each sport. Now, last week you mentioned that there were 63 national sports, mm -hmm. and we see that the ministry is involved in even the most um, insignificant of decisions. How is that so? Does not the sports law provide for um, a, a filtering process? And why does the sports minister have to get involved in every single detail? Uh, well, I don't think it's something that's exclusive to the sports minister. I think it's something that we see across the board uh, where ministers of every subject are asked to adjudicate on very irrelevant, minute issues that should not be taking up their time. And I think that is another knock-on effect of the lack of professionalism, the lack of accountability lower down the ranks. Across the board, Absolutely in every across field. The, absolutely. So sports, unfortunately or fortunately, is not the only, uh, only industry in which we see that. Uh, so that really does uh, become a problem because the minister has to authorize every team that is selected. Whether it's a junior team, uh, um, a national team that's selected, the minister has to authorize it. And unfortunately, this sports law says that anybody agreed with the decision of the National Association of Sport can appeal and then there's a two-week time period. Appeal directly to the minister. Uh, appeal, to the, appeal to the minister, yes. And that causes huge delays. I remember some time back uh, there, was a, uh, there was a dispute between who should be the captain of the Sri Lanka rugby team which was go traveling to the Asian. And they needed to make a decision quickly because a team was due to go. And the dispute continued. It came before the sports minister at the time. And there were two candidates. And the minister was pressed for time. And he said, well, we have two games to play. You captain one, and you captain the other one. So that's the kind of decision that gets made uh, because the processes are not in place to take account of the urgencies of sport, uh, to take account of the discretionary uh, measures that come into sport because your best player may not always be uh, your best captain and that's a decision for the coach and the selectors to make. Uh, so these are, these are little idiosyncrasies of sports law which politicians or administrators shouldn't get involved in. But in terms of the process being uh, followed, that's something the administration uh, can, um, can really make sure it happens. And honestly, if the sports minister is as involved as little as possible, it's best for him, it's best for the sport. That is so true. Um, Shanaka, I used to be a huge fan of cricket. Mm -hmm. um, used to be. Used to be, uh, mainly because uh, from 1996, of course, 
from way before 1996 mm -hmm. as well. I grew up in a family of boys, so naturally they loved cricket. And so I used to watch very passionately and I had my favorite players and so on and so forth. But over the past 10 years or so, that enthusiasm, that interest has dwindled and now it's non-existent. Um, not because of the performance of our players at an international level, but more so because of this is disturbing news that we we've, we've been getting about mm -hmm. this awful thing called match fixing. Mm -hmm. And last year there was this um, expose by Al Jazeera, uh, which which divulged some extremely disturbing details of the level of match fixing and corruption. Um, is this? I mean, do you believe that what was actually exposed or what was presented during this documentary is accurate? Is it really that bad? Uh, well, being involved in the sports broadcasting business for the last 15 years or so, uh, Mokshini, I have it on, on fairly credible evidence that this does go on. Uh, it's certainly not exclusive to the Sri Lanka cricket team. It, it is a widespread practice. I mean, we've seen uh, Pakistani players banned and things like that. So it is a very unsavory practice, again, fueled by money. And how can we prevent this in a Sri Lankan context? So Sri Lankan cricket players are played quite well, right? Uh, when compared to maybe their corporate counterparts, at a, at a young age, they're making much more money than CEOs of blue chip companies, right? Uh, so they need to realize that that is something that they can they can stick with for for quite a while if they play their cards right. Unfortunately, with the issues we discussed earlier, like the selections being kind of tampered with, with influence being used at, at various different levels, and that's the problem with the sports law at the moment. It allows for little loop well not loopholes, but it allows for little avenues for influence to be used at mm. every different level going right up to the sports minister. Uh, so that's an issue uh, that needs to be checked. So if players come into the game and you watch that Al Jazeera documentary, you'll see that there's a lot of money involved for not throwing the game, uh, Mokshini. And that's what I think took a lot of people by surprise. It's not like you're being paid to go out and lose a match. You're being paid to maybe bowl a wide at a particular point. You're being paid to maybe get out for 40 runs instead of scoring 41. Uh, you may be being paid to do something as trivial as wear a hat instead of a cap. So the players think, right, well, I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm not throwing this game. Let me take this money because Sri Lanka cricket is in such a volatile state. I don't know whether I'll get mm -hmm. selected again. So they are trying to make hay while the sun shines. I'm not condoning this by any stretch, but I'm saying this is the perspective with which these chaotic selections, this huge attrition of players, this massive rotation that we have of our squads, that's what it creates. It doesn't create the security of a player coming in to say, I'm going to be in this team for the next five years. I don't need your match fixing money. I'll make my money legitimately. I'll perform well, and maybe somebody will pay me to endorse a product and I can make some money uh, doing that as well. So as a result of these processes, you're making those players far more vulnerable to these crooks, and I, I need to use that word, to these crooks who are corrupting the game that you and I both love. So the lack of professionalism and efficiency has a knock-on effect to mm -hmm. such an extent that it affects a player's um, performance and and makes the player volatile and, and easily influenced mm -hmm. by these mischievous elements. Absolutely. Well, that is uh, quite um, what that information that you shared with us and, and, and the analysis on the state of sports law and sports in Sri Lanka, Shanaka has, I believe, been extremely enlightening. And uh, we are really grateful to you for using your vast experience and knowledge on the subject and coupling it with your knowledge as a lawyer and sports law to enlighten us, me included, on uh, what ails sports in Sri Lanka. I think, ladies and gentlemen, we all wish for the glory days of Sri Lankan sports to come back soon. And um, taken from our guest, Mr. Shanaka Amar Singh's lips itself, what we lack is professionalism and efficiency. Is that and right? And accountability. And accountability, that's right. So, Unfortunately, 
even though this conversation has been extremely interesting and I wish we could go on for longer, uh, we don't have time and we have to come to a conclusion on this topic of sports in Sri Lanka from a legal perspective. But on that note, I would like to thank Mr. Amra Singha for taking time his busy schedule to join us in the studios and ladies and gentlemen thank you for joining us i'm sure you enjoyed this week's edition of law and order we look forward to seeing you once again next week at the same time good night